All right, it is 6.30 p.m. and I'd like to call this meeting of the Community Development Committee to order. While this meeting is being held in person, in consideration of the ongoing COVID-19 health concerns, we are offering the option for the public to participate through Zoom if preferred. Instructions on how to attend virtually are included in the City Council calendar item listed on the front page of missionks.org. The public is also invited to participate in the meeting. If you are participating through Zoom, please either add your comment in the chat feature and it will be read out loud or note that you would like to speak and we will call on you shortly to make your comment verbally. Please remember your comments or questions are visible to everyone in the meeting. If you are part of our in-person group tonight, please raise your hand to stay seated and we will call on you to go to the lectern to make your comment. And it doesn't look like any is else. So this meeting will be recorded and posted on the city's website at missionks.org. Please contact the administration offices at 913-676-8350 with any questions or concerns. And it doesn't look like there's anyone who would like to comment at the moment. So we can jump into the agenda. Public comments, public presentations, informational. We do not have any public presentations or hearings this evening, so we will move into our action items. The first action item is the acceptance of the meeting minutes from Audrey McClanahan. Thank you. These are the June 2nd, 2021 Community Development and Committee meeting minutes for your consideration. Thank you. And acceptance. Acceptance. I'm good with that. All right. Moving on to the second item. It's actually our last action item for the evening. It's the resolution ratifying emergency expenditures for the 55th and Woodson sinkhole from Laura Smith. Yes, thank you. Uh, Council Member Boltinghouse, um, as you all know, we had um, a sinkhole that opened up at 55th and Woodson recently. Um, we knew that that section of pipe was rated as a five, which is the worst of the condition ratings that we have. Um, when we were notified of the sinkhole, public works staff uh, contacted Kissick Construction to repair the damaged pipe. They've done emergency repairs and other work for us in the past and have been very responsive and reason reasonable in terms of price. Uh, they quoted a repair uh, for the damaged pipe on a time and materials basis. They were able to start work the following day and we were able to have that intersection uh, opened up to traffic within three days. So I think we, we brought that to your attention at a recent meeting um, and indicated that we would be authorizing those emergency repairs, uh, which can be done under our ordinances, section 120.1405. Um, and then when those emergency expenditures are made, they are to be ratified by the city council. So we're bringing forward the final contract uh, price and expenditures in the amount of $24,872.81 to be ratified via the resolution in your packet. Any comments on this item? Recommend we take it to consent. Consent. Okay, consent. Laura, are there any department updates for the Community Development Committee? Item number three in discussion items. Okay. yet have a price that has been provided for the repairs of that one. Um, Silly, do you anticipate, no, do you wanna come speak to that just briefly, please? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, do I need to turn it on? Yep, that's well, probably not on. Okay, can you hear me? Um, this one's a little more complicated because there's three pipes coming into a manhole and with the traffic and the water one project right there, 
Kissick's trying to work with um, to get a lining quote as well as to open cut it. So it's taking a little bit longer to get a price. So I'm, I'm gonna call them tomorrow again if I don't hear from them and uh, try to get a price so we can get going on it. So <clears throat> be happy to answer any questions. Yes. Are you gonna be able to coordinate that with Water One and their project or no? Well, we told Kissick we needed it done before two weeks, but uh, Water One just called today and said they want to shut down the intersection of 51st and Lamar and that little section of Lamar between 51st and 52nd, the end of July. So we're we're going to make it work, but we're going to have to uh, really coordinate that. But yeah, we're working with Water One. In fact, they gave us a steel plate to cover the sinkhole, so they've been really good to work with. Where is that exactly? Because that's my neighborhood. I didn't see a sinkhole when I left to come here today. So it's 52nd on the east side of Lamar. On the east Did side, you see okay. that big steel plate and it has the caution tape around it? I did not see it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, so the barricades on the barricades on one side and you know on the south side of 52nd and the sinkhole with the steel plates on the north side so maybe just looking at all that <laughs> going on at once you may not have noticed it all right thank you very much all right all right thank you celia thank you laura does that conclude your update all right it is 6 8 p.m and with no further discussion that concludes what has to be a record time of the Community Development Committee. Again, this video will be, will be made public on our website at missionks.org. Thank you. I have a question. Is it a good time to ask a question? <laughs> Who is using the area right past Metcalf, almost aligns with I-35 on the west side as a staging area? And how long will they be there? Do we know? Are, are they preparing to do something or are they just? Okay. Okay, thanks. Are we ready to start the finance meeting? All right. It is 640 record time, Trent. Thank you. I'd like to call this meeting of the Finance and Administration Committee to order. This meeting is being held in person, but in consideration of the ongoing COVID-19 health concerns, we are offering the option for the public to participate through Zoom if preferred. Instructions on how to attend virtually are included in the city council calendar item listed on the front page of missionks.org. The public is also invited to participate in the meeting. If you are participating through Zoom, please either add your comment in the chat feature and it will be read out loud or note that you would like to speak and we will call on you shortly to make your comment verbally. Please remember your comments or questions are visible to everyone in the meeting. If you are part of our in-person group tonight, please raise your hand, but stay seated and we will call on you to go to the lectern to make your comment. Seeing none. When you make your comment, please state your name and city of residence for the record. Also be conscientious of others trying to speak and speak slowly and clearly. This meeting will be recorded and posted on the city's website at missionks.org. Please contact the administration offices at 913-676-8350 with any questions or concerns. Is there any member of the public who would like to comment now? Seeing none, we'll move forward. We don't have any public presentations or hearings this evening, so we will move into our action items. First action item is the acceptance of the meeting minutes from Audrey McClanahan. Thank you. These are the June 2nd, 2021 Finance and Administration Committee meeting minutes for your review. Thank you. Any comments on the, the minutes? Recommend acceptance. 
The last action item is the purchase of a portable incinerator for evidence destruction from Police Chief Madden. Good evening. Um, I won't rehash everything that's on the action item, but we are in desperate need of finding a way to get rid of our um, vegetative, vegetative evidence and other evidence that we have. We don't have any, uh, we used to have a private contractor that we, that we used, but they stopped accepting police department evidence and, and strictly do animals at this point. So we have a backlog of several years evidence that we need to destroy, which is extremely important to maintain the order of the uh, property room. I have a question. Yes. Um, with this incinerator, uh, how do the emissions, how are they ventilated? Are they ventilated outside or how's, how's yes. it happen? It's, essentially it's a 50, have you ever seen like a pellet smoker, like a Traeger grill? It's essentially one of those, but inverted. It's like a 55 gallon barrel. So it just has um, some, let me turn the volume on this down. I'm hearing myself twice. It just gets started and it contains and, and you know moves air around within the barrel. And there's just like with the smoker, there's smoke kind of at the beginning and then periodically throughout, but not, nothing, um, nothing too impactful, nothing more than just probably somebody smoking some ribs on a, on a grill. Okay, I, ju I just didn't know if you were doing uh, drugs, what is it hazardous? No staff at all, or anything like that, or ventilation. I know in, chemi in, in chemistry labs, you have hoods and all that that have to be processing right. the no. emissions. I didn't know if there was anything like that. No, we'll, we'll it'll be it's all done outdoors, and we'll do it you know at specific locations without having any impact. And it re it burns it and then reburns it a few times as it's as it's going through the cycle of of the incineration. Thank you. I hope so. I hope so. We can we can we can get you a good slab of ribs in five minutes or so. Okay. I recommend accept, acceptance. Acceptance. Consent. 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 Do you get that, Audrey? Consent. Okay, we have discussion items uh, listed and we have one discussion item this evening, which is on the 2022 budget from Laura Smith. Yes, thank you. Um, and Emily, if you could pull up the PowerPoint presentation. You had a lot of materials in your packet. Um, so we'll kind of hit some of the high points in the presentation, but uh, as always, please feel free to stop me and us as we go through this um, at any point. Um, okay, first, next slide, please. So tonight uh, we plan to cover kind of our general fund budgets for 2021 and 2022. As you'll recall, the last several years, we've really taken a look at uh, what's occurring in the current fiscal year and any adjustments that might need to be made in addition to the plans that we're making for the upcoming fiscal year. So we will hit kind of a quick revenue recap, um, some expenditure highlights, then we'll move into uh, the 2022 through 20, that should be 26, not 2016, sorry, capital improvement program. Uh, looking again, as we did uh, in our last work session at total asset considerations and reviewing um, various program scenarios in your packet, we included uh, two different scenarios, both for the stormwater program and the parks and recreation program. So we'll want to talk about the differences uh, between those as we continue to advance that to a final recommendation. We'll take a quick look at kind of an overview of some of the other uh, funds that make up, there's a total of 19 funds in the general fund budget or the city's overall budget. Um, and we won't go through all 19 of those, but uh, those that have some specific recommendations uh, for the 2022 
budget we will cover, we'll look at the supplemental budget requests and recommendations, which included uh, items that were submitted by each of the departments, uh, as well as things that have come forward through council retreats and or council conversations and priorities over the last several months. We we'll wanna talk about uh, the potential of our intent to exceed the revenue neutral rate for the 2022 budget um, and then confirm the remaining steps in the 2022 budget adoption process, which if we do intend to exceed the revenue neutral rate will, will um, allow us to slow this process down by about a month, give us a little bit more time <clears throat> to align with um, some of the additional information that we know we have coming forward specifically through the direction finder survey tool in the next couple of weeks. So next slide, please. Just a quick recap about why do we budget um, the budget is one of our best communication tools, both internally and externally, to help us identify priorities, goals, objectives, uh, and communicate those uh, not only to our employees, but to our residents and our businesses. Um, the budget helps us to identify the revenue and expense mix that is necessary to support and balance service delivery and infrastructure investment. And as we know, there, there's generally never enough money in either one of those pots to accomplish everything that, that we would like to. Um, so it is a constant balancing and rebalancing um, each year throughout the year uh, and, and looking forward into future budgets. It helps us plan and project future needs and challenges. And then um, it is required by state statute. And so um, some minor modifications as a result of the timing of the uh, Senate Bill 13 requirements, uh, which replaced, as you know, the property tax lid, but, but generally by August, if you do not intend to exceed the revenue neutral rate or by October 1st, in this case, um, each city in the state of Kansas has to have their budget adopted and certified to the appropriate county clerk so that those tax rates can be assessed um, on the tax bills that go out later this fall. So next slide, please. So as we know, our friend COVID-19 continues to have an impact um, and lingering effects on the 2021 and 2022 budget. Certainly we know that both last year and this year, it has slowed down our, our budget development timeline. Um, again, we're trying to you know, update and really look at uh, particularly revenues uh, each month as as they come in to make sure that we're on track or looking for opportunities uh, where we're starting to see things recover. We know that um, the COVID-19 pandemic resulted in serious revenue impacts both uh, in this last year and this current year and to a certain extent on into 2022, um, primarily related to parks and recreation revenues, which we'll talk about on a variety of um, future slides as we go through tonight's presentation. I think the long-term impacts remain difficult for any of us to predict. Um, and so we rely on some of the modeling scenarios that we built last year. Although uh, our biggest fear, as you'll recall, in last year's budget was what might happen with sales tax revenues. And we did not see any decline in those sales tax revenues, which was a real boost uh, to the budget process. We continue to see sales tax revenues um, performing at or above anticipated budget levels as we go into and, and move through this year. So if that continues, um, we'll be able to rely on that and we hope to see recovery in some of those other areas. Um, the goal obviously, uh, COVID-19 or, or not, is to continue to approach a budget in a more proactive manner rather than a reactionary manner, specifically trying not to overreact um, when we hit more of what I would call a crisis situation like we encountered last year. Um, and, and we were able to do that both last year as we put the 2021 budget together. And I think this year, as we look at the 2022 budget, again, based on a variety of factors, including the strong sales tax performance, um, the, our willingness to at least consider ex exceeding the revenue neutral rate for 2022 and taking advantage of the uh, growth in our assessed valuation throughout the community. Um, the specific allocation of the ARPA funding, which as we've talked about is just over one and a half million dollars, half which would be received this year and half received next year. 
and then really our very strong, particularly general fund, fund balance and reserve position. Next slide, please. So I think first um, we'll kind of dive into the general fund budget. As uh, you know, in, in previous years, we tend to approach this in more separate meetings. We'll kind of tackle the general fund in one work session and capital improvement in a second, and then marry those up. This year, we're kind of diving in this evening um, into both of those. We've had a lot of conversations throughout last year and throughout the first six months of this year uh, around uh, items on both general fund operations and our capital programming. And so it feels more natural to just kind of bring it all to the table uh, at, at this time and really address that. And again, we'll we still have time to adjust and react and respond um, before we certify a final budget. So our general fund budget is the largest budget of the 19 and it is an annual operating budget that really accounts for revenues and expenses kind of coming in and going out in a particular fiscal year. It is the largest single budget, um, and in 2022, uh, it makes up 53% of the total annual city budget. Um, so when we look at, um, that's also the place where we build our primary, primary reserve funds, where we have the greatest amount of flexibility in, in how we use uh, general fund reserves and or particularly excess general fund reserves. Uh, and then, um, just generally the approach to putting the budget together this year, uh, we took a very conservative um, approach in building the department baseline budgets. Um, and this year we worked as a, as a leadership team as a whole uh, on the budget. I think um, still with Penn and Celia being relatively new to the budget process uh, and, and we're small enough that I think it, it's important for us to be able to sit down and really look comprehensively as a leadership team at the budget. So we have done that and we'll continue to do that through uh, this process and building out 2022. Next slide, please. Some of the basic assumptions and special considerations for the 2022 general fund budget, again, we're um, assuming that sales and use tax performance will remain strong. Um, that is the largest revenue stream in the city's general fund. Um, the 2022 budget anticipates sales tax receipts between those captured um, that are our local sales tax and then the pass through sales taxes that come to us from the county uh, receipts totaling about $5.6 million or 42% um, of budgeted general fund revenues. The overall increase in revenues um, in the 2022 general fund budget is about 4% um, over 2021. And again, that is continued uh, strong performance by the sales tax and an anticipated uh, recovery in our parks and recreation revenues and the infusion of the one and a half million dollars in ARPA funds um, half in 2021 and half in 2022. From an expense standpoint, and this is where you'll see we've still been conservative, we estimated an overall increase in expenses of just 1% from the 2021 budget, excluding capital and supplemental, um, which will were detailed in a separate uh, portion of your packet and we'll cover uh, in a later slide this evening. Next slide, please. General fund revenues for 2022, um, again, we know that sales and use tax comprises the largest portion uh, of, our, um, of our general fund revenues each year. Um, and you can see here, we do break out sales and use tax. We just talked about the 42% of general fund revenues that is the darker blue slice of that pie at 30% and the intergovernmental revenue, which is the pass through from the county at about the 12%. The next largest component of the revenue stream in the 2022 budget uh, and historically has been our property tax revenues. Um, our assessed valuation uh, has been estimated at uh, $172,481,966, which is an increase of about 3% um, over last year. 
Um, interestingly enough, the largest overall category increase we saw was in commercial property valuations, um, as opposed to residential, which has been the primary driver in the last uh, two assessment cycles. So one mill in the 2022 budget will generate approximately $172,000 uh, for us. The draft budget that is um, being discussed this evening assumes that the current mill levy of 17.048 mills uh, would remain constant. If we were to observe the revenue neutral rate, um, that mill levy would drop to 16.3. Uh, so again, we'll talk about that a little bit more specifically on a later slide. Um, but as, as you're familiar of that total mill of 17.048, the equivalent of roughly seven mills are dedicated to street maintenance and transferred directly from the general fund where it's collected into the capital improvement fund to help support our street maintenance program. And that leaves a balance of 10.048 mills available and dedicated to general fund operations. Laura, I have a question. Yes. Do we have an idea what percentage of our property taxes are in arrears in the city? Uh, I, I think we anticipate probably delinquent taxes would be slightly higher. We don't get good data from the county in terms of, of that percentage. I mean, our, our collection percentages historically have been, you know, somewhere between 95 and 98 percent. So it, our delinquency rates are not um, significant, but I think this year um, part of um, that consideration, and again, we'll talk about that when we get into capital and supplemental or, or just the potential for a repayment um, pending the outcome of dark store uh, theory litigation. Then we have kind of coming in uh, parks and recreation revenues at about 10% uh, of our general fund revenues. That's a, a slight decrease um, from the past. As we know, again, that's, that's the area that's been hardest hit as a result of the pandemic. Um, franchise fees, which is um, the 5% franchise fee that is paid on all of the utility bills um, by all of our residents and remitted to the city. Um, brings in about 8% of our general fund revenues annually, fines and fees, um, about 6% other revenues, which is occupation licenses, building permitting, any other sort of miscellaneous revenue, about 4%, and then the 6% transfers from other funds uh, in the 2022 budget is 750, the second half of the ARPA fund, so $751,000 roughly. Um, next slide, please. Then we look just briefly at uh, general fund expenses by function. And in your packet, you have all of the line item detail uh, for each of our operating departments, uh, as well as some summary data um, that will show you by department and overall by function um, where those uh, expenses are, are spent and then also by character. And by character, that's when we break down personnel versus contractuals versus commodities versus capital. So no surprise, uh, the 2022 budget um, is still the largest component of that budget is public safety at 37%, followed by parks and recreation at 25%, um, public works at 22%, and that includes both the public works department and the community development department, and then administration, which is the legislative budget, general overhead, and the administration budget at 16%. So the 2022 budget as it's currently built incorporates a number of council goals, objectives, and policy assumptions, uh, including continuing to subsidize a portion of the residential trash, recycling, yard waste, and bulky item collection contract. Uh, WCA has notified the city um, that they anticipate a 3% rate increase for 2022. Uh, we would plan to maintain the franchise and mill rate rebate program at 100% of the franchise fees, 75% of total city mill, excluding special assessments, and 50% of the solid waste utility fee 
That's a program that we've had in place, I believe, since about 2005 um, and has been, I think, a, a good resource for many of our residents who are particularly on a fixed income. They have that opportunity to get, uh, to get a rebate. I think when we looked at some of those statistics um, earlier in the year, I think the average rebate is about $300 uh, per individual. And I know that um, Prairie Village has recently introduced a program. Uh, many of the cities in the Northeast have modeled programs after um, our franchise and mill rate uh, rebate program. The personnel costs included in the base budget reflect a 3.5% merit pool for both 2021 and 2022. Uh, we've tried to keep that consistent um, the last several years, and I think that has helped us to keep up um, with, you know, with attracting and retaining uh, employees. Um, and again, we'll see a supplemental consideration and request for implementation of, of um, classification and compensation system changes. The 2022 proposed budget does not include any new positions. Um, there is a reclassification uh, that you saw in the supplemental that we'll, that we'll discuss and consistent with what we have done in the past, we do not specifically budget for lapses in full-time employee positions. We do typically realize savings in our personnel line items over the course of each fiscal year as a result of position vacancies and other things, um, but it is not something that we specifically budget for. We have included an increase in health and welfare benefits of 5% over our 2021 rates. You'll recall that for the last two years, we've been very fortunate. We've, we've had a 0% increase in health insurance, uh, which has been a tremendous benefit, both for us as an employer and for our employees. We don't expect that to hold the third year in a row. Um, so we have budgeted for a 5% increase. Uh, we're planning to maintain funding for the business improvement grant program. Uh, I believe there's $35,000 that's included in the budget. Um, and then evaluation of the highest priority capital equipment technology purchases um, for each department based on planned replacement and identified needs. And again, most of those are included in the supplemental requests. So expenditures in the 2022 proposed budget total uh, $13.2 million, $11.9 million um, in actual departmental expenses and $1.2 million in transfers to other funds. So again, we transfer uh, about $1.1 million out of the general fund into the capital improvement fund for street maintenance. And then we also make the transfer into the solid waste utility fund to subsidize a portion of those costs for our uh, residents. Um, Again, just kind of going through your packet and your memo, the largest expenditure category. I did not break it down by character in, in tonight's PowerPoint presentation, um, but the largest expenditure category in general fund continues to be personnel. Um, it's budgeted at approximately $7.88 million, um, representing about 66% of our general fund budget expenses, excluding the transfers. Again, does not include any new positions. Um, and there are currently 73 full-time employees authorized in the budget. That's a decrease actually from the 2020 budget um, where we were at 75. We had added two positions for the directed patrol unit in the police department as we've gone through um, and looked at the needs and then the COVID situation, we committed to backing those positions back out of the budget entirely. So you don't see them reflected at all, even as position vacancies in 2022. Um, and so there's a breakdown uh, included in your packet of how those 73 um, full-time employees are allocated across our various departments. Um, Contractuals and commodities make up the next largest share of the general fund expenses for a combined total of about $3.6 million. So just roughly half of what personnel costs are. And that's a 4% increase over our 2021 estimated. So contractual services are those things that are provided or secured through contracts with others, things like utilities, legal services, engineer and architect services, prisoner housing, 
uh, maintenance and operation of traffic signals, et cetera. Commodities are the consumable goods, fuel, salt, program supplies, uh, vehicle parts, that sort of thing. And I think um, the departments should all be commended on their really consistent and continual management of their budgets on an ongoing, um, on an ongoing basis to control expenditures in both of those categories. And then in 2022, in the capital sort of debt service lease payment category, expenditures that are included in the base general fund budget total less than $20,000, um, some minor equipment in the police department, uh, the, the majority of the capital expenses, we'll talk about a supplemental request. The 2022 bu proposed budget does include lease payments and debt service in the amount of $432,538. And that includes the roughly $80,000 uh, existing debt service payment that we are making on the acquisition um, of our streetlight network uh, that, was, that was purchased in 2013. That debt will retire in 2023 if we don't restructure it as a part of the FCIP or Facility Conservation Improvement um, debt issue that we'll be considering uh, in the next couple of months. And then the balance of that $432,000 is for the FCIP program. And so um, we took a corresponding decrease in the appropriate utility line items uh, and um, operations and maintenance line items. Um, so the actual impact or increase of that in terms of tapping into general fund expenses uh, was about $113,000 um, minus those, those other savings. Um, as we've already talked about, uh, we have uh, funds transferred um, to the street maintenance program, the solid waste utility fund. At this point in the general fund budget, we have not recommended any additional transfers. I think one of the things that we'll want to kind of keep uh, in the front of our minds in future years is a potentially a transfer, or reinitiating the transfer to the equipment reserve and replacement fund. Um, we've been able to take advantage. We made some transfers into that fund initially when it was established. Um, we have been depositing as we sell vehicles and equipment um, the proceeds have been going back in to replenish that fund and it has provided kind of a good relief for the general fund, particularly for the purchase and acquisition of some of the larger pieces of equipment. But we can't continue to, um, we're drawing down that uh, fund to a point where in future years, I think once we get to 2023 and beyond, we'll want to think about uh, meaningful transfers there. Okay, next slide, please. And so finally, as we kind of look at the general fund, um, we've talked a lot over the last several months, really the last year and a half about general fund reserves and our general fund fund balance. Um, we've put together uh, a budget as presented that still maintains uh, the, the um, restricted or 25% fund balance goal that the council has established by policy. Um, we have a couple of other items that are committed or assigned, one of those being ADA funds that, that have been collected through the court system, totaling about 184,000 uh, and that are restricted in terms of their use at this point for specific ADA improvements. Uh, and then there's $250,000 now that has been received from uh, EPC uh, under the terms of their development agreement. We got the last $50,000 recently because they hit their final milestone, which was the occupancy or leasing uh, rate in that facility. So tentatively, we had earmarked that for improvements to downtown parking. Uh, so we have restricted that, and you'll see that in kind of the committed and assigned category in your general fund fund balance. Um, what that means, particularly in that case, is that the council has to take formal action uh, if you want to reassign things that have been previously designated. And then what we tried to do in your general fund summary in, your, in the um, budget book itself was to show you then what that excess fund balance. So it, it, in addition to your 25% reserves and those funds that are committed are assigned, what is that excess fund balance? And you'll see in the base budget, our 2021 uh, estimate is about 
2 million in both years, 2021 and 2022. At this point, before we address any of the other capital or supplemental, we have about 1.2 million uh, in those excess general fund reserves. So GFOA recommends, as we've talked about in the past, no less than two months of operating reserves. Our 25% fund balance policy gets us to closer to three months of operating revenues. So certainly within uh, good benchmark and best practices from that standpoint. And as we know, really our general fund reserves are designed to mitigate revenue shortfalls, un unanticipated expenditures um, to help us ensure stability in our tax rates and fees. Um, but they can be very dependent on a number of other factors that are unique to each community. So you'll see um, different communities having uh, and setting aside and establishing different fund balance reserve policies. Um, but things that, that might influence that are potential exposure to one-time expenses. Uh, in the past, we've, that for us has been repayment of the transportation utility fee. Um, we, we held funds and were very judicious um, until we were able to resolve that. Um, reliance of other funds, particularly those with debt service requirements that may be dependent on sales tax revenues or, or revenue streams that may be more volatile and reactive to the environment so that you have the ability in an economic downturn to um, continue to make your debt service obligations. And then as we know, and as we've heard, as we look at financing that our, our fund balance position uh, can have an impact on our bond ratings and uh, has been part of the reason why we've had very favorable uh, and in fact increases in our bond ratings um, in recent years. So again, uh, fund balance position is strong in both the 2021 estimated uh, and 2022 in this base budget. Um, and when we get through the capital and supplemental, well, we've got uh, as we t I talked about in the memo, we've got an interactive tool. And so you can kind of see in real time as we add things in uh, what impact that might have on that bottom line. So next slide, please. I'll stop there. Any questions at this point on the general fund before we move into the capital improvement program? Laura, I had a question. Um, one of my questions was if you or Peng could address the basis for the community center projections. I know it's kind of a best guess at this point, but it looked like that's a pretty steep recovery curve going from $832,000 expected for this year to $1.273 million next year. Um, and so I was just wondering, seems kind of in the middle of our 2019 revenues and our 2021 revenues, but I didn't know if there was any other um, basis for that optimism, I guess. So a couple of factors, and that's certainly, um, I think we just closed, uh, we just got the June month end reports that landed in my inbox late this afternoon. So uh, even when we move into the community dialogue on the budget, um, we've been seeing incremental increases and in returns in our parks and recreation revenues. That's This is certainly an area we're gonna need to continue to revisit the balance of this year and into next year. Part of what's driving that increase in 2022 is an anticipated return um, adding probably close to almost another $100,000 in camp revenues. Um, we do have, we did offer camp this year, but we um, cut back from 180 campers to 100 campers. And so a lot of that uh, is attributable to, um, to camp revenues, but we will need to continue. Um, we, we know we have some of our long-term rental contracts that are coming back online this month and as we move in, into the next several months. So we will, and, and that number may be revised again before we get to the end of our budget process based on what we see in the next couple of months. I guess for now, do you feel like that's an optimistic number, a pessimistic number, or kind of somewhere? In the I middle? think it's, it's somewhere in the middle, probably more on the optimistic side. Um, and one of the things that, that we'll talk about when we look at capital and supplemental, again, is kind of a prioritization uh, as we move forward so that, um, what I think from a, the staff's perspective is we'd like to go into the balance of this year and next year with some definitive things that end up in the recommended base budget, uh, but then other items that are prioritized that we can then specifically address. So as we see hopefully increases in revenue streams or s expenditure savings that we know that this is the list and this is the priority 
with which we'd like to add those things back in. Thanks, Laura. I guess related to that, as we've talked about those recovery numbers and you know what is the right percentage of cost recovery for the community center, I know there'd been some talk before about trying to do a feasibility study on the community center and you know looking at what those projections might be you know, for the next five years, are we gonna get back to that 70%, 80%? You know, I don't think anyone really thinks we're gonna to get to 100% anymore, but you know, what is that number? And I'd, I'd like to see that added to this year's budget, you know, funding to do a study like that for this building. Okay, and that, that was not included. I know that is something we have talked about and I wanted to talk about in more detail this evening to make sure that before we go out uh, and solicit a price on what that might look like, that we're very clear about what information um, you all are looking for as we make decisions for the future. So absolutely, that is in my parking lot category this evening um, as we move through the supplemental requests. Okay, anything else on the general fund? Laura, I had a question. Yes. Um, I assume we're gonna talk more about general fund reserve funds later tonight. So yes. I'll hold that piece, but I just wanted to have a, a point of clarification. The $5 million that's in the general reserve fund, I think on the two previous slides, um, that includes the $751,000 that would be coming from the ARP funds. So at the end of this year, we'd be looking at more like 4.2. No, so if you look at the the, in your general fund summary page in your book, if you look at the year end estimate for 2021, that $5 million beginning number is where we ended 2020. And so in the 2021 year end estimate column, you'll see we start with that 5 million and then you'll see the transfer in of $751,000, which is the half of the ARPA funds. Then when we get through expenses and the transfers out to the other funds, you'll see that our projected ending fund balance at the end of this year is 4.8 million. And then that 4.8 million is broken out below the 3.198 is our 25% fund balance. The 434 is ADA funds plus EPC uh, receipts. And then your excess fund balance uh, is that 1.193 million. And so similarly, uh, that 4.8 uh, is where we start 2022. We have another influx of $751,000. And before adding anything else in, again, you're looking at, at ending 2022 at 4.9 million. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go ahead uh, and, oh, sorry. I did have one other question about mm -hmm. the assumptions and maybe this makes more sense in this, once we get into the CIP and we could park it for that, but I have some concerns about the stormwater maintenance and the stormwater fee. You know, I know the recommendation is to hold that stormwater fee um, steady, but it looks like, you know, even in the five-year CIP, we're looking at best case scenario, scenario $100,000 a year for maintenance um, and you know maybe it's prompted by the two sinkholes but I think I don't, I don't see things getting better in our stormwater situation unless we start investing more dollars so I think when we're talking about um, either the CIP or use of the um, fund balance that might make sense or looking at that rate um, I guess I'd be curious why the recommendation is to hold that rate steady, the stormwater utility. Yeah and I'll talk a little bit about that when we move into the CIP program there's a couple couple of reasons that I think make some sense, at least uh, from our perspective for this year. Um, certainly council's prerogative to, to look at making changes to that, but. Um, okay, let's go ahead, next slide, please. We'll move into the capital improvement program. So again, uh, I think everyone's familiar that we look at a five-year capital improvement program uh, or CIP uh, and, and next slide, please. Uh, in the past, and again, this year we're really focused in three primary program areas, streets, stormwater, parks and recreation. As we talked about at our last work session, um, as we really continue to build out the picture of our total assets and our total needs, those categories are much broader than these three program areas that are included in the CIP. We know and understand that. Um, and we, we talked about this slide and I did go back and add streetlights and traffic signals to it. Um, 
following our last meeting, but really these are kind of the general categories, streets, stormwater, parks, public buildings and facilities, technology, and then vehicles and equipment. Um, we are furthest along as we talked about at our June work session in the streets category. Uh, we've done enough work in that street asset inventory and looking at needs and identifying needs that the council established the ballot language for renewal of the um, dedicated street sales tax at three eighths of a cent and increase over the current quarter cent. And we know that that is headed to a mail ballot an election in September of this year. Um, we know that our street needs still outpace the revenues that we have there, but once we uh, can get through a successful renewal of that sales tax, we can then continue to build out and look at how best to use those resources um, or increase those resources to accomplish the projects in an unappropriate time horizon and to leverage outside dollars, whether that be federal funding or CARS funding through, uh, through the county. Stormwater is kind of the next category where we have, um, we've ha had more significant work done in terms of building out the asset inventory and condition rating. Um, probably, and this, this will tie into Council Member Flora's question about the stormwater utility rate, we are still waiting on the watershed study from SMAC and the kind of revamping of that program. And that's going to be very helpful and inform, I think, a lot of our conversations going forward in terms of what we need or how we will be able to use and leverage uh, other people's money uh, to assist us in, in the stormwater program. So it's a little bit, uh, we're flying a little bit in the dark without the benefit of that watershed study at this point. Parks and Recreation, uh, and again, so we continue to work on building out uh, options, needs, all, you know, alternatives, threats and opportunities in each of these categories. And once again, it's just a constant rebalancing and reevaluation of the priorities. We know that even with dedicated revenue streams, when we turn the knob or the dial in one category, it, it certainly has an impact um, on other areas of our operation, both um, specific service delivery and the, our infrastructure investments. So next slide, please. As I mentioned, uh, typically we look at the capital improvement program in three program areas, storm water and, and what I focused on in the presentation this evening are those local revenues. So those things within our control uh, we know we use dollars in each of these categories then to leverage outside uh, grant funds, SMAC funds, uh, CARS funds. But on the stormwater revenue side, we get, currently we have a stormwater utility fee for annually for a single family household is $336 a year. Um, so that stormwater utility rate is said, I can never remember whether $28 per ERU per month. Um, and then for anything that's not a single family residential property, that ERU is an equivalent residential unit and it is 2,600 square feet. And so we calculate the impervious surface. So parking areas, uh, rooftops, et cetera, on our commercial properties to come up and then divide that by 2,600 to come up with an equivalent uh, number of ERUs that are then assessed back in terms of the stormwater utility rate. So the stormwater utility fee generates uh, about two, two and a half million dollars annually um, for stormwater needs. Um, that has historically been set at a rate to generally just cover debt service um, in that program area. Um, as we know, the other thing that factors into um, the stormwater revenue category is the special assessment on the gateway property, which is approximately $600,000 a year. And then drainage district revenues. So we have drainage, Rock Creek drainage district number one, which is exclusively the gateway site, generates at this point somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, less than $5,000 annually. And then Rock Creek Drainage District number two, which covers 
essentially uh, follows the creek and captures um, the majority of those properties that were impacted by the revised FEMA floodplain maps back in the early 2000s. Um, the drainage district revenues, the, um, the, the board members for the drainage districts are the, is the city council. So it's subset one and the same, uh, which is why we consider the drainage district budgets as a part of our annual budget process each year. Rock Creek drainage district number two generates somewhere in the neighborhood of 85 to $88,000 each year. I have a question going back to the uh, stormwater utility fee. Mm -hmm. uh, where is the source of that data? Is that from the county in terms of the property ERUs? No, so when the stormwater utility fee was originally established, we had city staff who sat down and mapped out all of the properties that were not single family residential properties and went in and actually drew pentagons and shapes around all the impervious surfaces uh, to calculate those. And so as um, we'll, those are reevaluated periodically um, we haven't had a lot of change in terms of, um, you know, commercial properties, large commercial properties that are putting in uh, any sort of stormwater best management practices or, you know, converting, you know, impervious pavement to pervious pavement and those kinds of things. So we haven't had a lot of adjustments over the years, but that was work that was originally done and would be updated, is updated periodically internally. Um, okay, so those are those are the um, revenues, stormwater revenues. Uh, again, with the special assessments coming from the gateway at six hundred thousand dollars a year, we generate uh, close to three point two million dollars annually. Without that special assessment, that drops to two point seven million. Uh, what what we showed. Uh, we only show, well, no, we did, we did show two stormwater program plan options in your packet. The first is assuming that that $600,000 assessment is paid each year in the five-year CIP. The second, uh, which we, we believe is probably the more conservative and where we should approach the 2022 budget, assumes that we have that assessment paid through this year uh, and then does not factor in that six hundred thousand uh, dollars a year for the balance of the five-year program. We know that that um, we have recently declared the developer in default of the development agreement to uh, get those taxes paid. We will continue to do that as long as we have an active development agreement under which we can, um, you know, monitor and and watch that issue. Um, it doesn't mean that our access or that that six hundred thousand dollars goes a, goes away. It just means that if the property were to go into foreclosure, or those taxes were not to be paid absent of a development agreement, we have we're sort of at the mercy of the county and and another process outside of our control um, by which we would recoup and recover those costs. Yep. I was just thinking on the development agreement, if we were ever looking at it again, um, could we perhaps request um, an established fund that would ask for some of those payments up front to be held in reserve so that we could plan for planning purposes? Just a thought. Yeah. So again, I think what we tried to do in that no gateway assessment was really take the most conservative approach. Um, the refinancing that we did of some stormwater debt uh, earlier this year, and I think we saved uh, about $800,000 in interest payments over the life of, of those issues, really helped us. Um, in last year's budget process, without that gateway assessment, we were upside down in terms of stormwater program plan revenues in the 2023 budget. So you'll see, even without the gateway assessment beyond this current year, um, we are not upside down um, in terms of an immediate need to look at an adjustment in the stormwater utility rate. We know, as Council Member Flora said, that where that impacts us most significantly is it doesn't give us a lot of flexibility to address maintenance projects. Uh, we're still 
relatively um, tied to just generating enough revenue to cover our debt service. And debt service in the stormwater utility fund, um, that's the longest debt that we have issued and that goes out, our last stormwater debt will retire in 2029. So several years remaining on that. So I think the thought in not recommending an increase in the stormwater utility fee for this year is that with the pending um, renewal of the street sales tax, uh, the council's at least preliminary conversations about putting the parks and recreation sales tax uh, on the ballot for renewal. Uh, I think in our last meeting, we talked generally about an April of 2022 timeframe. Um, that, and knowing that um, we'll have some decision points around uh, the gateway project and its future uh, by the end of this year when the current uh, redevelopment agreement expires that it, it felt as if looking at an increase at the stormwater utility fee while we had these other two sort of asks pending publicly um, maybe wasn't the most prudent approach and that we would have time to be able to address uh, certainly acknowledge that we have plenty of stormwater uh, needs that exist there. Um, so that was that's why I think really the driver in our recommendation not to recommend an increase this year. And, and certainly I think by the time we get to this process for the 2023 budget, we will have the watershed study. We will have a decision uh, on both of our current dedicated sales taxes um, and, and hopefully the ability to kind of move forward uh, on that front as it relates to stormwater. On the street revenue side, um, local revenues, gas tax distribution from the state, which is a pass-through revenue, uh, about $250,000 a year, a quarter cent uh, dedicated retail sales tax, uh, and seven mills assessed for street repair and street maintenance. If the sales tax is renewed at the 38 cent rate, uh, which has been uh, recommended for the September ballot, um, can expect to generate about $2.37 million in annual revenues that are dedicated um, to streets. Again, um, you have the bulk of that coming over in the transfer from the mills in the general fund that have been dedicated to street maintenance. And then on the parks and recreation re revenues, currently have a three eighths of a cent retail sales tax and one third of the alcohol tax uh, that is distributed through the state. So if the sales tax were to be renewed at three eighths of a cent generates uh, locally about one, just slightly over a million dollars. Uh, if you renewed uh, the parks and recreation sales tax at a quarter cent, you're looking at about $700,000 annually. And we built out two different program scenarios for you on the, um, only one on the street program side two on the parks and recreation program side. Again, there's been some conversation in our previous meetings about maintaining a consistent sales tax rate that we have currently recognizing that um, if three eighths cent for streets is approved, we would have a slightly higher rate potentially for uh, some period of time. Um, but we wanted to just kind of show you the impacts um, of both the three eighths cent and the quarter cent in on the parks and recreation side. So in the, the two program plans that were included in your packet, my apologies, um, we looked at the difference in rates and you'll see one year, so 2023 looks a little bit strange because we will have the existing sales tax rate at three eighths of a cent in place and collecting revenues through the first quarter and then the second quarter would be when uh, the new rate would go into effect. So you'll see blended um, and, and slightly different uh, revenue numbers for sales taxes uh, in, in that 2023 year. Then what we did um, on the parks and recreation side, we've historically built out capital projects as they relate to outdoor parks, uh, the MFAC and the Powell Community Center we've looked at kind of more maintenance or operations fund, in some cases building reserve funds and then debt service payments for parks and recreation amenities, um, which at this point is just the debt service on the outdoor aquatic center 
and that debt retires in 2014. Um, one of the other things that we built out in um, both of the assumptions on the parks and recreation program side was, was based on some of the conversations we've had in recent weeks, and that was assuming renewal of the sales tax, what would it look like if we issued roughly $5 million in bonds to accomplish park improvements? I think based on some of the conversations that, that we're seeing coming out of the uh, conceptual park planning, that number is, is probably going down uh, slightly. Um, but generally, we, we made the assumption if we issue bonds to accomplish parks and recreation improvements, so we have a greater, more immediate impact in our outdoor park system, what would that look like in terms of the debt service that we would take on uh, over the life? And so the one thing I didn't uh, include, and um, Council Member Flora had a good catch, it, it's a wash, but I did not put in bond proceeds. Um, or the project accompanying projects. So basically the program plans that you're looking at are the, still the bottom line impact that we would have there. So I can certainly um, go back and plug that in if it, as we move closer, but um, tried to be sensitive to some of the conversations that we've heard in recent weeks, um, recognizing that we do still have needs uh, and deferred maintenance needs, maintenance needs at this facility um, we tried to sort of bring down the, the investment being made here over the next couple of years, um, kind of building enough to accomplish the um, addition of the restrooms and the pavilion at Mohawk Park in accordance with the priorities that have come out of park master plan and the uh, conceptual planning and the stakeholder groups. Um, this plan does not include funding for the dog park. Uh, the conversation that was um, that occurred at our June work session, I think the recommendation was to take that out of excess general fund fund balance. So that's kind of where it's it's in a parking lot or pending pattern right now, could be taken out of um, the parks and recreation uh, CIP dollars as well. But what we did is you'll see at the bottom of that program plan that we deferred several of the large projects, roof replacement, track, uh, replacement of the track here. We wanted to identify that those are certainly still needs, um, but I think the, the recommendation is to defer those pending the outcome of a feasibility study. So while we have those significant expenses, I think um, it, it seems to be the, the desire of the council to, to have a better sense of what are the long-term goals and objectives for this facility. Uh, we don't wanna lose sight of um, the projects that might exist out there, but I think the conversation needs to shift slightly about um, an investment in that feasibility study to, to better guide our future decisions. So I would like to pause there and just talk a little bit about, we haven't included a specific um, budget request either in this park CIP or in the general fund for a feasibility study. Um, you know, I think as we look at that, um, I've heard, I've heard, you know, potential, you know, different uses of this, this facility and innovative. I mean, so I'm interested in just some, maybe some basic conversation and maybe Penn has some thoughts as well to help guide us in terms of knowing how to structure a feasibility study. Um, you know, I don't think from at least what, I'm, what I've heard or I'm understanding coming from the council that you want it to just be, you know, continuing to operate this as a community center and nothing but a community center, but I don't know where all of that is. And I think that, that discussion would be helpful for us as we think about what a feasibility study might look like. I, I have a comment, but it's not about the feasibility study. So at the end, I have a comment about the whole framework of our park system that I'd like to ask a question about. Okay. So we can come back to that. So how much does a feasibility study cost, general, and not a catastrophic I would say you're probably in the neighborhood of twenty-five or to thirty thousand dollars. Is that fair, Mr. Omni? Laura, oh, sorry. I have a question. Sorry, I had a hard time hearing. I didn't hear you talking. Um, I, I like the idea of a feasibility study. It's hard for me to imagine putting 
more dollars into the community center on top of the FCIP um, that investments that we're making and then what's slated here for CIP um, without considering other uses for the space, um, whether that's just being generally, you know, changing the use of the space or you know, I, I think it can still be a community center. I think it's just what else could it be used for, for the community? So I, I don't know enough about feasibility studies to say anything more than that. Yeah, Laura, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ken. Uh, my question is with regards to all the facilities, in terms of the facility planning that we've been talking about, I think that this needs to be looked at in the context of that because there are aspects of space and utilization of space that might be beneficial to the overall needs of our facilities in general. Uh, and that's something that probably should be in integrated in this. I do think too, in my mind, that a feasibility study could be something that's more phased as well. And that would start with um, getting some expert advice on what you know, realistic revenue projections look like, you know, with the status quo. So are we really back up to 80% cost recovery in two years? Or has the market completely changed such that we're never going to get back there? Because I think conversations about this building, yeah, if it's if it's feasible, you know, doing what it does now for the long term, maybe sure at 80%, but you know, not at 50% or 30%. And so I think having a more realistic sense of what recovery looks like would be a good starting point. I would tend to agree there with, with Council Member Flora on that. Um, it's hard to look at the next few years and see this place getting back to 70 or 80% cost recovery. And if we don't, I mean, I don't know how realistic it is to keep operating at, at the status quo. I don't think that's realistic at all. Um, we can't afford to operate at 30 or 40% cost recovery here. Um, it's just not feasible. So I don't know what we can do to try to get a better idea of what, what some of that cost recovery might look like in some of those scenarios. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns there, but personally, I don't see a lot of the rentals coming back. I don't see a lot of the members coming back, um, at least not anytime soon. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not trying to be negative about it, but I just think with some of the other options that people have, have gained access to, just in the last couple of years with the nicer, newer community center down the road. You got, um, I know some of the rentals have, have found some other space that they really like. Um, and you got Planet Fitness a few blocks away that's cheaper than being a member here. And I know they don't have the pool and some of the other amenities, but for the people that are just going to work out, I think that's been a good option for a lot of people. I, I don't know. Well, and I think as we evaluate it, one of the things that I think we've come to realize um, and it had probably is having a greater impact than a, a Planet Fitness and probably more slowly is the impact of the insurance memberships. Um, so as we have uh, patrons and users of this facility who are effectively not paying out of pocket uh, to use the facility and our revenues are capped um, at you know fairly low percentages, um, you know that's something I think we're gonna have to really seriously evaluate as well. Um, certainly a benefit for our members and our patrons, but it's, it's not financially sustainable model, um, you know, for us. And we've seen that increase dramatically over the last probably two and a half to three years. Um, I have a comment. You know, we keep talking about cost recovery and we keep talking about this facility in terms of its service to the community. We don't expect the same for other departments. We don't expect the same for public works or other departments. We, that is an expense. So the degree or the assumption that we need to have cost recovery at 80%, this is an asset to the community. And we just need to make it more of an asset to the community. But to say that it's, uh, you know, that it's no longer a feasibility in terms of uh, an asset to our city and that we subsidize a lot of things and so we just have to determine to what extent are we willing to subsidize yeah just to just to clarify a little bit too when, it, when i said it wasn't feasible what i'm what i specifically was saying is not feasible is to con continue operating at you know 30 to 40 percent cost recovery um, i i think we can all agree that that's a pretty big hit for the city and 
you know, not everybody has a membership here. Not everyone in the community does get to take advantage of this space. Um, you still have to pay for that, you know, for, for the general workout facilities and the pool part of it and everything else. So aside from some of the events where it's open to the public, there might not be a whole lot of use for a number of people in the community. Um, and we are having to subsidize a lot. And I, I definitely don't want that to be anything against the staff and Penn, you guys are doing a great job. I think it's, it's just more of a circumstantial problem, changes in the market, um, changes with other competition around us that's, that's really taken a toll on this place. So. In concert with a potential feasibility study, I would also like to see, we used to get a, like a statistic sheet that told us how many rentals, we had a marketing coordinator that marketed all kinds of facets of the community center. I haven't seen anything like that for a couple years now. There's some way we could find out how, how many people are using, outside people using this for wedding receptions and retirement receptions and things like that. That would give some idea. And then it kind of lends itself to, are we marketing it appropriately? So I think we need to look at all those in concert with the feasibility study because your goals are different based on where you're coming from, where you are in the community, outside the community, and what, what you want to see for this facility. So that's my personal opinion. I just, oh, sorry. I was going to say I had to piggyback on Ken's comment. You know, I do also view this as a community asset, but I think, you know, I'm not saying get rid of it by any means, but I think if we are talking about you know, 30% cost recovery for the next decade, then we do have to do some reimagining and, you know, what else could we be doing with this facility that, like Hillary said, is still a benefit to our community, but it maybe isn't what it looks like today versus if in a year we're going to be back at 80%, then maybe we don't need a lot of reimagination. Maybe it's successful as it is. Yeah, I think I appreciate Councilmember Davis's comments about looking at all of the facilities and that interrelationship. Um, I do think that's important. And I, and I also think it's what, you know, as we can identify um, what is a realistic cost recovery goal, part of that, like we always talk about, is what is the appropriate time horizon over which to, you know, to get there and how can we manage that both in the shorter term and, and the longer term. So I think in, that's helpful. I appreciate that. And so I think as we move through, again, the feasibility study was on our radar. Um, we just wanted to have a little bit more conversation. And I think we can then go back and um, uh, consider it or maybe add it to the capital and supplemental requests and see where where we want to plug that in. Okay, anything else on uh, local revenues in any of those three program areas? Yes, I had something on parks. Yes. Did we get, were we gonna get a collection of the, the feedback, a collection of the pieces of paper on the feedback from the meeting, the comprehensive master plan park meeting we had last week? The concern I have right now, and I think it's valid, we're looking at a variety of things in parks, at least at Broadmoor Park, which is my perception still a neighborhood park. People were looking at water features, basketball courts. I saw nothing about a basic swing set or teeter totters or anything that actually made that park fairly successful. And I hate to see us get away from completely traditional values to put forth something we have no concept if it could succeed or not. And I just think we need to kind of look at getting back to basics on maintenance of the parks that we currently have before I continue to vote for something in excess of what we have on a general regard for our parks. I want to see basic maintenance. I want clean restrooms. I want trash cans and recycling cans. Some basic things that are not overly costly but to me, those come before any kind of extra components that we want to add to any park. The things around the city right now, I'm just noticing some things that are getting, it's not a staff problem, it's not a council problem, it's a community problem where we have the bin on Johnson Drive and Broadmoor that's got clothes hanging out of it and things like that. And I'm thinking we get, need to get back to basics on beautification and what we can do with the least amount of money that makes the most amount of difference to people who use this city every day. Or I had one further comment on stormwater. Um, and I, I know it's not the most exciting topic, but I just, even if it's not this year, I think we've got to come up with a plan that gets us more than $100,000 a year in maintenance on our stormwater system, given that we keep, we have lots of fives out there and we keep seeing them fail. And, you know, maybe for a short term, expense, you know, deal with the emergency you have versus the one you might have and maybe put 
that 275k that's slotted for the dark store theory fund or some percentage of that, you know, towards, um, you know, the, the critical stormwater components um, and, you know, deal with the dark store um, liability if and when it arises. Just one thought on that. Yep. And I think the other thing, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Council well, I think we should go ahead and wait for what the county goes ahead and decides and perhaps leverage some of those funds before we uh, you know, make some, we've got, we're putting a lot of money or a lot of burden potentially on our taxpayers here. I'm very much concerned about that. You know, was, we're going to ask for a sales tax increase for streets, you know, and then we're going for parks and, you know, I just don't think it's, I think it's premature to go ahead and do that right now. I, I know we've got failures every once in a while, but that's part of running a city government. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Yeah, and I wasn't saying to increase it now. I think the staff explanation on that makes sense and it is a lot all at once. I was just suggesting that maybe that 275,000 that was allocated for a dark story, dark store theory reserve that we could consider using some of that for the more immediate needs, you know, whether it's stormwater or whether it's some of the basic maintenance that Debbie has pointed out, you know, some of the things that are right in front of us. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think the other thing that I didn't point out in the stormwater program plan, which is important to do is in last year's plan, we did not include any specific larger scale projects. There are two larger scale projects included in the proposed uh, 2022 to 2026 plan. So Rock Creek Channel repairs um, that between design and construction of a little over 500,000 and then Rock and that, that is west of Reeds Road and then Rock Creek Channel repairs Outlook to Woodson at about 1.3 million. And so obviously those are in programmed out in 2023 through 25, but that also provides some additional flexibility. Uh, I, you know, we need to commit to those, but those are some really large projects. And, and we took away in last year's plan, we had about half a million dollars annually for the maintenance type projects. We went ahead and programmed them this year, understanding that those needs may have to shift, you know, based on, so there is some flexibility in there with existing projects. We haven't, it, it looks, um, I know my, my initial reaction, as Celia and I were working on this was like, we can't, $100,000, we're gonna be constantly going back to the well on, you know, on maintenance projects um, every time we have a sinkhole that, that opens up. Um, but there is some of that flexibility, even without that, so those larger projects you'll notice are programmed even without the gateway assessment. So I think there is some flexibility and again, contributes to why we suggested that we not address a, a rate increase at this time. Okay, then if we, next slide please. If we move to the expenditure highlights uh, in the program categories on the stormwater side, um, I just touched on the Rock Creek Channel repairs west of Reeds. Storm, and actually these are not in 2022 itself, um, but in that 2022 to 2026 plans, um, the stormwater maintenance of 100,000 and then the debt service. And we are continually evaluating opportunities. Um, and as you know, we every chance we have that it makes sense, we'll bring forward a refunding or a refinancing uh, in order to save um, our, our residents and our taxpayers dollars there. I do think we have, uh, if we look at some things collectively, we don't have any single issue right now that makes sense to do a refinancing, but I know Bruce is, is looking at bundling some things, um, particularly as we look at the FCIP improvements um, for that. On the street side, uh, you'll see the annual residential street maintenance program. Um, then in 2022, we're looking at the UBAS treatment of Johnson Drive from Lamar to Rowe, which includes the reconfiguration of the section between Lamar and Knoll to three lanes. Um, you see design of Fox Ridge Phase Two improvements. Uh, that is a CARS project, and as we've talked about um, in the past, that that will potentially require us. That's a larger scale than we can cash flow in a particular year. Uh, again looking at getting through renewal of the street sales tax and then being able to have a more comprehensive conversation about uh, 
debt financing that might make sense as it relates to streets, whether that is the larger scale cars projects or an acceleration of the residential ma street maintenance program, both of which I know uh, we have talked about. Then we have street uh, debt service. Um, you can see that really um, all of the, the debt, current debt service related to streets uh, falls off by 2023. Um, we have been, uh, again, stormwater was where we extended our debt service beyond that 10 years. That is kind of our standard policy, our street debt service we have kept at uh, 10 year uh, horizons. And then miscellaneous repairs, and you'll see um, beginning in 20, 22 and 23, kind of starting to set aside and carve out some dollars for a dedicated curb um, and sidewalk program. And then on the parks and recreation side, a look at getting through the construction of Mohawk Park restrooms and pavilions. And so uh, I think this scenario, and I'm, I'm standing here flipping through my pages and I realize I may not have provided both scenarios you may have gotten a program summary instead of two parks and recreation scenarios. So I'll, we'll update the packet uh, in the morning. Um, but we, we wanted to look at, uh, we played with that assuming receipt of the 300 and some odd thousand dollars in grant funds for Mohawk and without the grant funds, uh, knowing that those, those improvements have been a priority. Uh, the, again, uh, dog park at Broadmoor and in the supplemental requests, um, we plugged that in at about $200,000. Still in relatively unknown, needs some more refinement, um, maintenance, a uh, variety of maintenance projects at the Powell Community Center and the MFAC and then debt service on the uh, Outdoor Aquatic Center, which will retire in 2023. Um, and again, we just we talked about um, looking at renewal of that of that sales tax then being a specific driver um, as we finish up our conceptual master planning in each of the major parks. Um, which, if you haven't, I don't know. I drove down the street after being gone for a couple of days, and the new park sign was in at Anderson, um, and I'm assuming they're up in some other places, but they look nice. Um, that was. So is Mohawk. Mohawk is blank, has a blank slate, but the, okay, good. I was looking forward to that for this, this weekend. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, any other questions, discussion, conversation around the 2022 to 2026 CIP? Mm-hmm. Well, I, and I only have one page, so I'm operating at an even greater disadvantage, no surprise. We will figure it out, but yes, so one of them, one should be quarter cent. I probably didn't change the heading. Um, so three eight cents. Second page, I believe, is the quarter cent. Yeah, the quarter cent is going to generate, starting in 2023, about 665000 Um so I'll make that clear and clean that up. Okay, uh, other fund highlights. As I mentioned, we have 19 total funds that are included and in all of those funds. The line item detail um, was included in your packet for your reading pleasure or when you want an alternative to taking a sleeping pill or something like that. Um, one thing I did want to mention, one of the things we've talked about, and I know Celia is, is working on, and so before the end of this year, we've talked about developing project budgets for our larger scale capital projects so that, in, and incorporating those updates in our monthly interim financials so you have a better real time look at kind of where we are in terms of actual expenses on a project. I know historically we've given you just kind of this look at the 
you know, conceptually at the beginning of the year, and then we true up the actual expenses. Um, so giving you that opportunity to kind of see how the how we're tracking on a project. Um, okay, other fund highlights, the MCBB fund. This is the fund that we're required to have to account for the transient guest tax revenues that we currently receive from our one hotel. Uh, funds are primarily used to support the mission production printing distribution of the mission magazine five times a year. Uh, one of the things that we've looked at doing, we've incorporated it this year. Um, and we've upgraded to a much, I think, more robust digital platform, which allows readers to better access the magazine from any device, not having to sit and access the flip book on the website. Um, we've also introduced a digital cover sponsorship, um, which uh, allows um, us to sell that, obviously, in, in a digital format um, and provide some greater opportunities for us to actually expand advertising space in the digital version of the magazine. Uh, one of the things um, we have taken the digital sponsorship, the last uh, two issues, um, the first one kind of tied to the introduction of our new website. Um, and this next one, um, the editorial board uh, is talking about um, looking at longtime advertisers or consistent advertisers uh, and basically doing a drawing or a raffle for those who have invested in the magazine over the last 11 years to try to continue to generate interest in, in that digital cover sponsorship. Um, so we continue to see that that grow. Um, we have in 2021, um, we have already transitioned the Mission Business District funds out of our record keeping and bookkeeping and they are, have now taken that back over, which is great. Um, there was a hesitancy many years ago um, for them to do that, but we have taken that step and then we, are also in the process and before year end, you, you saw a standalone um, family adoption fund. So in order to just kind of keep the MCBB fund as clean as possible, we have created a standalone fund for the family adoption program. So it will be more um, clear in, in tracking uh, revenues and expenditures. But I can tell you that um, the going going into the 2021 year, um, we have roughly somewhere between 13 and 15 thousand dollars in carryover funds to start the year. So we're in great shape uh, for that. I know um, Penn kicked off family adoption committee meeting um, this year, so that's well underway. But that fund is in in great shape, and I think it'll be much more transparent to track it that way. We have a variety of TIF and CID funds. We're required statutorily to create separate funds um, to account for uh, TIF and CID revenues that um, are accomplished through specific redevelopment projects. Um, the distributions from those funds are controlled by the existing redevelopment agreements. So there's not a lot of um, really anything to discuss or budget budget for. You'll recall that we typically, um, as assessed valuations have gone up and CIDs have continued to perform, we've had to typically amend those budgets each year to account for revenues that weren't initially anticipated at the beginning of the year. Um, so right now, those include Mission Crossing, Cornerstone Commons, uh, the locale developments. In the Special Alcohol Fund, um, generates $70,000 in revenues, uh, we think increasing to closer to $90,000. Um, currently, we pay about $50,000 out of that to United Community Services Drug and Alcoholism Council. Um, $15,000 supports DARE programs and really um, mostly accounts for the time. We generally transfer that uh, into the police department's personnel. Uh, line item budget, and then $30,000 in the current year budget supports the mental health co-responder program, and you'll see when we walk through the supplemental requests that um, we've got a proposal to add an additional $50,000 of that to add a second co-responder in 2022. And then the solid waste utility fund, which supports our um, residential trash recycling and yard waste contract, 
Residents pay about 85% of that. The city pays about 15% of that overall contract with a subsidy from the general fund. And as I mentioned before, we're anticipating about a 3% increase uh, in the 2022 contract. Yes. This is probably going back to Parks and Recs and it has nothing to do with budget. I just was wondering if there's a possibility of getting a report on our tree adoption program for the 70th anniversary of the city of Mission, which passed five days ago. Yes, we can I, update that. I think we're at, I don't know, how many trees have we planted? 19, 19. but we'll give a formal report on that. And we'll, put, we'll do another push to get, see if we can't get some more in the ground before the end of the year. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, Senate Bill 13, we touched on this uh, at our work session on June 23rd. Again, our current mill rate is, this is the replacement legislation for the property tax lid. Um, not sure it's any better or any worse, just different. Um, but it does require us if we are going to exceed a, um, if we're not going to have a mill levy that equates to revenue that is neutral to the previous year, we have to give notice to the taxpayers of our intent to exceed that revenue neutral rate. So our current mill rate is 17.048, as we mentioned before, um, based on the calculations um, provided by the county. Our revenue neutral rate for the 2021 tax year, which is the 2022 fiscal year, is 16.3. So the difference if the council wants to exceed that is approximately $135,000 in additional revenue. If we look at that difference for your average homeowner in mission, it's about $22 a year or $1.83 a month. Um, I think there had been generally some uh, consensus or indication that the council would like to maintain the mill levy at 17.048 and take advantage of that growth and assessed valuation, uh, particularly in a year where we're, we're trying to rebuild um, and account for lost revenues and we have a number of other, um, other priorities. The process for this, so what, what I would um, ask the chair to do is maybe just take kind of a general straw poll about around consensus. Um, the, the formal notification requirements that are prescribed in the legislation don't take effect until the 2022 tax year, which will actually be our 2023 budget year. So this year, uh, we do need to capture on the record in some format our general intent to exceed that revenue neutral rate. Uh, we need to communicate that to the county by July 20th. Unfortunately, our Legislative meeting this month is July 21st, so the timing didn't line up very well. Um, but in conversation with uh, most of the other cities here in the Northeast and throughout the county, many are, are sort of documenting that in minutes. We'll provide notice to the county, and then if we wish to pass a formal resolution later in the process, we can, can certainly do that. So, so you would entertain a motion to either do the RNR rate or stay with the current mill levy? Uh, yay or nay, how, how would you prefer? So I think if you would just ask for, yes, just a b basic straw poll about comfort level and exceeding or the intent to exceed the revenue neutral rate. Okay, and then we'll go through a vote or do you just want us to verbally express it? I think you could verbally express that. Okay, is anybody in favor of maintaining the renewable rate? at 16.300, or exceeding, excuse me, excuse, excuse Yeah, exceeding, exceeding so it. If, 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 right, so I think the question is, would it be the council's intent to exceed the revenue neutral rate for the 2021 tax year? Correct. I'm seeing eyes, and or nay. Okay, all right. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, capital and supplemental requests, probably the part that everyone's been waiting for all night long. So thank you for tolerating up to this point. Um, in your packet, we provided a some kind of a summary page and that's where I will start. You can't read it in the presentation, but if you'll flip to that page in your packet, 
Again, um, part of our, our budget process each year is to ask uh, each department when they submit their departmental budget requests to submit any supplemental requests related to personnel, capital, new programs or services that they would like to have considered uh, either in the current fiscal year with an adjustment to the budget potentially or in to the future uh, fiscal year. So what, what you see included on the summary sheet uh, is again, what was submitted and has been discussed and prioritized by the leadership team, as well as uh, some conversations and some um, issues that we've identified uh, collectively as a council. And you can see that total for the supplemental request at just slightly over $1.7 million. What we then tried to do, and we'll go through uh, and just kind of talk about highlights, and I know that um, tried to give you a, a little bit of narrative, but if you have other questions for any members of the leadership team on their specific requests, I know they're happy to answer that. But then not all of those requests impact our general fund budget. So we then tried to break that out uh, in the next section and identify uh, which fund the supplemental requests we would recommend um, they be funded from. You'll see the general fund had about half a million general fund fund balance, about half a million, the MCVB fund, 60,000, the equipment reserve and replacement fund, 300,000, the special alcohol fund, 50,000, and then kind of just parking lot future asset considerations of about $315,000. And as we move forward in future budget processes, one of the things that you'll see us as a staff doing is identifying more of those anticipated future parking lot issues so that we start to capture those in our discussions and understand what might be coming um, coming down kind of the pike at us. Uh, and then you'll see um, those that we've recommended. So of that 1.7 million, um, what's been recommended uh, and not yet included in the base budgets is a little over 1.2 million. Um, so I'm going to run just quickly through these, um, and as I do them, if you have a question, why don't we just kind of address it at, at that particular item. Um, and again, I know anybody on the leadership team would be happy to answer in more detail. Um, so on the administration side, uh, this is really a critical item, and we would recommend doing this in 2021, our access card reader system. Um, is effectively uh, non-functional. Um, and so it's kind of band-aided together. Uh, we had hoped to, to be able to push that into 2022, but I think at about $45,000 to upgrade that system, which is basically your swipe cards um, that provide access, it's about $45,000 to do that and tie that into and integrate it with uh, the security camera upgrades that we did a couple of years ago. Um, and pardon my spelling. I'm still fighting with Microsoft Office on spell check. Uh, we're, we included $40,000 for consulting services for implementation of the financial management software. Uh, one of the things that I think you've seen happen is we've carried $100,000 for the financial management software in the budget for many, many years. And it rolls over into fund balance and we bring it, bring it back. And then there's something else, whether that's a comprehensive plan update or um, court software or building permitting software, something else that sort of pushes that um, and the time available. So I know that, um, Brian uh, and, and Debbie Long have done some research on what it would take to, to bring someone in to help us sort of get that project finally across the finish line um, and accomplished this year. It, the $100,000 is included in um, the general overhead budget for 2021. Um, classification and compensation system update of about 150,000. Uh, when we talked about that previously, the number was a little bit lower, but that was base salaries only. And so this, this will pick up any of the impacts that we have to benefits as well. And we would bring, be bringing back a specific implementation proposal later this fall. Um, to be, and ideally that would be something that would be implemented in 2021 
as well. Um, we're also looking at a server and switch replacement and the replacement of 15 laptop computers. Laura, are we currently leasing the laptops? Have we purchased them? Are we doing an analysis like every year or so to find out if we're better off on a technological level for leasing versus owning? We're purchasing, we're not leasing any of our computers. And I think the, we are not analyzing it every year, but I think that um, the investment for us to purchase makes sense at, to do that rather than to lease that. So if we equipment. replace them, what are we doing with the laptops? So they get sur they're just surplused and wiped and recycled. I mean, do we think about letting the grade school or have them? We could. We haven't really explored that, um, but we could certainly look at other disposal options for the laptops. Okay, thanks. They're pretty um, for probably meeting the technological needs of even elementary school children. By the time we get rid of them, they probably don't have much value to that to that group. Um, in the community development department, uh, we've included a hundred thousand dollar request for a comprehensive zoning code update. I think we've talked periodically that, particularly coming off of the update to our comprehensive plan. Um, our zoning codes just need a major overhaul, um, sort of better coordination. This is one um, that, again, I think as we look at this, um, budgeting that in 2022 and maybe kicking that off in the latter part of 2022, once we know, I think we can scope that um, more successfully once we get through all the final recommendations of our comprehensive plan. Um, and again, Part of the, the reason in looking at the consulting services on the financial management software is I know that financial man if we go down this path and look at a zoning code update financial management software because it's essentially the same group of folks um, and a lot of overlap um, will take a back seat again. Laura, mm -hmm. um, that sounded like a recommendation for the comprehensive zoning code update but i see it didn't make it onto the recommended list so should it be on the recommended list well i think yes i think the timing of that is something that we want to talk about then parks and recreation i would add here we'll update this the feasibility study that we discussed earlier this evening and then the request that you see here um, is for $18,650 is to look at changing some of the strategy and approach of how we're sending out some of our current marketing materials, particularly our activity guide. Um, we're looking at mailing, doing a second mailing this year was included in the budget, correct? And so we will be doing some surveying and some tracking when we do that, that second mailing this year. So for the last several years, we've printed three activity guides a year and we've mailed one. Um, and the other two have just been available here for pickup in the center. Um, one of the things we're looking at is trying to do some more targeted mailing uh, of a second activity guide and then being able to track and see how much uh, membership rental activity um, class and program enrollment that we're actually generating as a result of that. If we aren't getting a return on our investment, um, this is certainly something that we would adjust and, and not recommend um, leaving in the budget for 2022. Uh, for the police department, we have server replacement, um, ex uh, expansion of the co-responder program, Again, we mentioned originally we had uh, the chief and I have been in conversation with the city of Miriam. So right now we we share a co-responder, uh, Miriam Mission, Roland Park, Westwood, Westwood Hills. Yeah. So five Mich Mission Woods. Okay. Obviously, Miriam and Mission are the highest users uh, of that co-responder. When we looked at some of that data earlier this year. Um, we identified that about 10% of our call load uh, included a mental health component of some sort. Um, I know there had been some questions previously about whether that was a position that we wanted to add. Uh, internally, I think the structure of relying on the county to hire and train and have access to the other mental health resources makes the most sense in the long term. 
Um, I think both as we've talked with the city administrator and the chief and Miriam, I think there's some longer term structural changes uh, that we would eventually like to recommend to the county that could make one of the things, for example, we know our co-responder was on maternity leave at one point, and so we didn't have a co-responder assigned. Well, they don't have a pool of co-responders, so we just went without a co-responder for a certain period of time. We don't think in our conversations that that's the best way to do it, um, but that's a longer term conversation with the county about can you increase the size of your pool and share among all of the cities so that we can have um, access to a co-responder if you've got vacancies or maternity leave or leave of any sort. Um, originally, we were talking with Miriam about not expanding that program until 2023. Um, but I think it has kind of bumped up on, on the priority list both for Miriam and for us. And so I know that the chief and Miriam's chief met with the, the program administrator uh, in the last couple of weeks. And um, we would recommend hiring, that the county proceed to hire a second co-responder um, so that we could increase the availability, um, particularly for our two communities. And so 50% is half of salary and benefits um, for that co-responders position. And again, we're recommending that that come out of uh, the special alcohol funds, which is where we're currently paying for the mental health co-responder. Uh, oh, yeah. Just a quick question. So this is in addition to the 30,000? Yes, so total of $80,000 in the 2022 budget. Okay, and so that will give us, just a quick reminder, access to essentially 20 hours of this new person per week plus how many hours a week of, of I don't the know. other portion? Chief, you have a better, do you wanna come? Thank you. So in our discussions with them, we had talked about what is, you know, what's the more appropriate response? Is it more days of the week or more hours and days? And I think right now we're leaning towards more days of the week. Uh, because there's so many other administrative things that have to occur. Um, so to have some overlap and then the additional services they, could, they would be able to provide include things like short-term counseling to kind of bridge the gap between a crisis and when somebody can get an appointment with a provider um, and just so adding some services into municipal court as well. So there's a lot of other things that we could probably realize some some benefits from with the addition of a second. Would the second one only be shared between us and Miriam as opposed to the other cities? Well, currently those, those are the only people we've had discussions with. So we're kind of planning, anticipating on, on sharing them since we're kind of late in, in the season of the budget season. Um, but we are still going to have the conversations with them and we're all, we're also going to be co-applicants co, uh, for a grant. And so it could reduce the costs as well. But we just wanna be prepared if, in the event we aren't, we aren't successful with the grant. I think one of the other advantages, and I know we had the presentation from the, the folks from mental health before was, having that ability to have a co-responder in our station more frequently and have that interaction on a more regular basis with our officers and certainly expanding the program to two would uh, give us that opportunity to have one house here and one at, at Miriam. Uh, the computer information specialist, which is a position reclass. Again, we said no new positions in the budget. So this is an existing position that would be reclassified to really focus on sort of the data collection, reporting, compilation uh, for the police department as those needs continue to increase as we look at the niche system, as we look at Cognos um, and a variety of different things. Um, I think for roughly $20,000 between the training uh, and the increase uh, in, a, in a grade for that um, for that position. This would also help support uh, the transition to the Microsoft Office 365 that we've done recently citywide, um, kind of take on some of the responsibility for maintenance of the access system, the security cameras, some of those other things that are, are being managed um, in support services. 
in the police department uh, currently and um, quite honestly, in some instances are taking time away from the availability for officers to be on the street um, patrolling. And then replacement of admin investigations vehicles. If we were true to our 10 year replacement cycle, we would be bringing forward a request to replace six admin vehicles in the police department. And I have to commend the chief and his staff for really looking at um, mileage and maintenance of those existing admin vehicles. Um, and they're only requesting to replace the one that has the highest uh, mileage and, and seems to be um, creating the greatest maintenance headaches. Uh, I think certainly, um, I, I think we've heard the council say, and we're interested as we look at moving forward with, with some of the restructuring that the chief has proposed that a more comprehensive look at vehicles overall in the police department is appropriate. Um, so for this year, we wanted to limit that, that request for the replacement of vehicles in the department. In the public works department, single axle dump truck, a compaction roller, heavy equipment trailer, uh, Ford F-250 pickup, all of which are really integral to the street maintenance work and street, street maintenance program. Um, an automatic gate for the public works facility. And, and the majority of those items are recommended to be funded out of the equipment reserve and replacement fund. There are sufficient uh, dollars available to do that as well as, and I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mention the replacement of the admin investigation vehicle for the police department. The automatic gate for the public works um, facility. I think Celia can answer any questions if there was anything more ab above the narrative. That's not something that we um, have recommended at this point. This is one of those items where I think if we see uh, revenue recovery or expenditure savings that we would, we would come back later uh, in the year and, and recommend that one. And then as we move into city council and other, we've got the dog park um, reserve for the dark store considerations, uh, site improvements at the Mission Market, um, street light pole banners and ride KC dockless e-bikes, um, the market site improvements, uh, pole banners and dockless e-bikes are all recommended to come out of the NCVB fund. Um, and I think I'll ask Emily to come. She just mentioned to me, she's got more information on the dockless e-bikes. I know that's a request that we've had from some residents and, and some council members. Um, and then you'll see the two kind of parking lot, no pun intended, items that we have. Um, you know, I think that's part of that bigger facility feasibility study, what happens. We know that the parking lots continue to de deteriorate and we just wanna make sure that we're keeping those public facilities on our radar, at part of our conversations as we look at that total asset plan. And then an ADA compliance plan. Uh, this is something that I know Celia has been working on and talking um, with our engineering consultants about. And this would be really a, a citywide ADA compliance plan, whether that's in our public facilities or streets. Um, and this would be recommended to be funded out of the general fund fund balance in those restricted ADA funds that have been collected. So we have $184,000. Uh, having this plan doesn't mean that we have to, there's not a specific then time horizon on which, um, but it is important uh, if we have questions or challenges to specific ADA issues to be able to document that we have the plan. Um, and then this will allow us to more effectively plan for those improvements, whether they're in our public facilities, uh, on our streets, uh, in our parks, et cetera. I just wanted to, um, I sent you an email, but I wasn't sure if you got it, that this will be ongoing costs because this plan is kind of a basic plan, but it'll, it, you can either do the inventory of the streets or the, do the inventory of the buildings to identify ADA deficiencies. And then you have a plan eventually to address those. So this isn't a one-time fee. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that, but it is something that's really important and necessary. Thank you. Um, we have heard a number of suggestions for the e-bikes. Um, and when I say e-bikes, it's electric assist, which I think everybody is more and more familiar with. Um, we have heard a re uh, request from a local business, a council member, um, a user who was um, 
uh, promoting them as something that was working for her in later life and could be a really nice Communities for All Ages benefit. So we have always been in conversation with uh, Bike Walk KC over time. And as their product has evolved, it becomes more attractive for us. So before they had, you know, you had to go from dock to dock. Um, now you can, um, they have a hub, but you can secure it to any rack anywhere, and then it gets relocated back to its hub. And the electric assist makes it much more feasible for potentially a Lamar bike lane hill or those kinds of things. So we were attempting to get in, uh, wanted to get something in front of you in this budget cycle to consider and at least have the discussion. Um, bike Walk KC only undertakes these things with, um, you know, a really keen eye for success. And what you don't want to do is enter kind of the, the uh, bike share world with kind of a tepid start and then get low ridership and then have the program not be successful and then come back to talk about pulling the bikes or, or that. So this funding amount represents a full hub of, um, I believe it is eight bikes and then the, the hub itself and some signage. Um, those single hub systems work best in recreational settings. So like Johnson County Parks has used them well or Lenexa Parks where they're, they're recreational use. And I think it works with the Rock Creek Trail to some degree, but it is, you know, a straight trail and not, you know, it's more transit oriented in terms of trails, I would say. Um, if we want to look at this as a true transit um, supplement or amendment, Bike walk would be recommending multiple hubs. And so it would be this times however many. And so you'd think not just of having one location, which could be purposeful and serviceable, but potentially three, four, five. And to make it a true system where Mission has a hub down at Quick Trip or a hub at Broadmoor Park or a hub where you really are building your own network within Mission. And I had been considering it previously to be sort of tying into the Kansas City network, um, but I think this is a low number. So I didn't want to not talk about it or not put it forward, but if we wanted to engage in this, I think we would have further discussion with Bike Walk KC, um, potentially a feasibility study to really look at where it would make sense. The nice thing as a caveat to that, these hubs are easily transportable. They're not permanent. So if something almost works, but not quite works, we could look at those ridership numbers and make an adjustment. But still, I think the recommendation from them and their professional opinion would be that we wouldn't go this low to start in order to really launch it and really engage in having this available for our residents. So. Do the rental rates, um, does that come back to us to help offset the cost of any of the maintenance? Because I see it's not just the, right. I mean, this is over 2200 per bike, but then it's also 1500 per year per bike right. ongoing maintenance on top of that. What happens to that rental revenue then? Does that help offset any of that or? I can't speak to that. I know that they have coached us to look into sponsorships. Um, I think that's what most people do. I don't so, know how, but that- It's so safe to assume that Bike Walk KC doesn't give any of that back to us to help cover I, any of that, that ongoing not. cost either, right? Right, and the maintenance is to keep the bikes, obviously you would understand, but to, you know, keep the bikes in working repair, and then also to return them regularly to their hubs and all the tracking and that. Sure. So just full disclosure, I wanted you to be able to talk about it with all that information. Are there any other options besides bike walk, Casey? I know in the scooter world, there's, you know, bird and some of those, but those can actually generate some revenue at least where you're not paying in tens of thousands of dollars a year to help offset the cost of it. So I, I don't know. I don't know if there's any other options there, any other rental type programs, but I'm not opposed to the idea. I just think that's a lot of money to spend for bikes that, you know, we, we don't know how they're going to get used and it seems a little expensive to me over two grand a bike and 1500 a year ongoing too so i like the idea of bikes or scooters or something but i'm kind of with nick seeing more options together might make sense um and i know prairie village is doing a pilot right now so i don't know if there's a way to explore with some of the scooter companies or even with bike walk kc if it's possible to do you know a lower cost no cost pilot before we commit to one option or the other. Yeah, I, I don't know the answers to those things, um, but I could, we, you know, we just keep discussing it for sure.
Laura. I don't, oh, sorry. Uh, it's okay. No, you're, you're the okay. the money that is scheduled for the parking lots. That that's we don't have any intent of doing anything in the next year. Well, that once we do a drawdown, will they'll just be carry over each year for? Yeah, the, it, it's going to go on a list of. A, a true parking lot. So if you think about that total asset slide where right. we talked about public facilities, we're going to start to build out future capital projects um, so that we can then at some point when you look at your five-year CIP, you'll have a public facility program plan just like we have um, streets and, and stormwater and parks and recreation. Okay. Thanks. I was just going to bug Emily about Pole banners and the mission market side a little bit more. Please if, do, because I, <laughs> I need to learn Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of ground. Eat your tennis shoes. Yes. Um, I was just going to ask what you were imagining for new pole banners. And also, um, I read what you're describing for the mission market site. I was just going to encourage, which you know, I have long been wanting some sort of structure there, um, some sort of shade or tree initiative for us to begin to give some natural or permanent shade structure for folks if we're looking at water elements as too, or as well. Yes, thank you. So for pole banners first, we were thinking um, two sets a year to keep them fresh and looking right as a start. So that number represents, we still have some remaining funds from this year's budget that we were targeting for a new design um, around the winter season. Um, so we'll be coming up with some designs for that, for a switch out towards holiday shopping and, and that. And then um, two different designs in 2022 that would rotate through to keep those. And I, and I, you know, we don't know for sure the condition of the ones that have been taken down, but potentially, you know, you could recycle depending on the condition they were in or how fresh any of those, you know, felt to build your kind of library of rotating them. Um, but that was what that represents. That answer that, and then for the market, um, it is true it is a uh, modest request, but water is what the staff would like first and foremost um, um, to have that service available there. And then next would be an expansion of electrical service for the vendors that are there. So in terms of just the function and and the and the space at the at the market, and I believe to to serve the downtown area. Um, the water fountain and the dog fountain and a water bottle filler would be nice for all of you know, the community, not just at the market. Um, the, the power is at this time at the back of the site and running it towards the front to avoid the long extension cords would be really desirable. Um, and then following that, I think so the operations of that and so that involves we do we have confirmed that the line is there the water line remaining from the building and that this would represent the tapping of that and setting the new meter once you have a drain you have to have the sanitary line but that puts us in a position then to have bathrooms someday potentially um, so those those things would be um, a head start towards that goal um, I know you and I we've talked about um, uh, thinking more about the the aesthetics of the site or, you know, putting our kind of flag in the ground beyond just the market sign that is there now. And, and as, uh, you know, as we, up, you know, we, we steered away from some major structure like the Overland Park structure or the Merriam structure because um, we're, our flexible model, we kind of like playing with that and it, it feels like that site might be other things to other groups or used in different ways or just re maintaining that flexibility until we had kind of a bigger plan. And honestly, I wasn't sure where that fit in with all the other conversations with parks um, for the master plan and the conceptual planning that goes on. Um, so a lighter touch option that could potentially be a compromise would be um, putting some type of permanent structure or covering over the musician pad just for the sidewalk sale. We had musical events that were there and could have used, you know, a in place, ready to go shade structure, much like a shelter that you might rent at one of our other parks. Um, that would eliminate, you know, for our side, you know, eliminate two of the tents that we have to pull down and set up every time. It would provide a covered space and potentially some bench seating or something where someone could have a sandwich under shade when we weren't having to lower and raise the umbrella. Um, I don't know about the aesthetic improvement and, and your goals for that in terms of what you'd have to spend until you really had, you know, made your mark in terms of changing the character of that site and what really that looks like more comprehensively. Um, we're looking at it as operational and trying to be, 
you know, like I said, modest in the request and, and cognizant of a lot of different parks needs that are going on and not quite sure where the funding, you know, would come or whatever, or where the priority for that lies. But water for us would make quite a difference. That power upgrade would make a difference. And I think potentially the next step would be to find some type of comparable design that would work for a shelter upgrade look and feel that we could do at the smart music pad. But yeah. Or, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Hey, Emily, at one point, CapFed was thinking about helping us out with some of that. Is that just dead in the water? Or? Yeah, the parties drifted a bit. Um, they were, um, I can't, I don't want to, you know, publicly mischaracterize it. It's been a bit, but um, they, I think that it was fair to say they were thinking of a very large scale um, very interconnected program plan similar to what they have developed in Topeka that would have involved full-time programming and real aggressive return on their investment for programming and it felt a little like too big for us like that's not who we are what we like those weren't our goals so thinking about um, they were really focused their their ad and marketing team thinking about it in terms of a um, around the clock, around the calendar kind of programmed space, which would have been a whole nother book of business for us to take on um, in terms of, of that. And, and, and the modifications and, and what they were prioritizing in terms of the whole site plan, we do have still great work done from that endeavor that you know, gave us a lot of good ideas and, and could someday be a full plan and redevelopment of that site. Um, um, but in terms of their involvement, it sort of felt like um, a different type of impression than we were getting at first. Sure. Yeah. Could, could we add to that water electric structure list fencing, both from a safety perspective and that aesthetic perspective? Like, that's the only thing that freaks me out at the market is the kids who are like climbing yeah. under the fence edging, you know, by the channel. And so I think both I from a look and safety perspective, that would be good. Yeah, and I can't remember if Celia, you and I have talked about that, but thinking about um, an improvement to the chain link first, but then the rock wall second, and then the overall street or it's creek program plan overall. I don't know. I don't know. And we're kind of up in the air because some of those rock creek projects that we have in the stormwater fund, they're maintenance projects, but we're trying to see if the county identifies them as flood control too, we can get money paid for. So. We just need to be careful about doing too many improvements in case you know we're going to have to remove things. So I mean, a fence isn't a, a lot of money, but we just need to think about that. And then it, as far as any development in the floodplain, we have to do modeling and make sure that you know we have a floodplain development permit and all that to make sure. So I know that you're already aware of that, but just a reminder that we need to be careful about putting structures back in the floodplain that could cause a flood rise. So not to say we can't do it, we just have to do the modeling for that. So. And I mean, there are, um, I mean, maybe we could do a further review of safety. I mean, I do know that we have the kids back there oftentimes, but, um, and, um, you know, so far no gaping holes, <laughs> but I suppose we could check. And I don't know if there's an interim solution there just for the safety concerns that wouldn't probably help the aesthetic goals, but could potentially be something we could do. Well, it's good to know it's on the radar with in connection with the other Rock Creek projects. That it, makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it feels like a thread to pull that way. Emily, I've got one yeah. more thing to add. So um, it's exciting thinking about us getting bigger and, and growing larger. But before we embark on those discussions, can we also get um, just a, a, um, an, a more of an update and kind of revamp of the conversations that we had when we kicked the market off because I know that there were a lot of community members and there was like an A, B and C and we had discussed the shading and, and all of those. So I don't want to reinvent the wheel and I, I think that it would be great to go over those again. Yes, you mean when we first when we first had the market advisory committee? Yes. Or when we did that, okay. Yes. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, those are all great. And I mean, there's so oh, um, uh, feasible in terms of, you know, there was an element here and an element there. So some of it, I mean, I do think the creek question is is critical to that, the figuring out 
you know, do you play up the nature element? Do you, you know, not and that, and so then you can play off of it. So we've been trying to have this light touch to improve around the edges to begin, but they all play well together. So we could certainly do that. And I just want to add, I, I understand my dream of, you know, a million dollar structure may not ever come to fruition, but I, I just, I hear from folks so often about shade when yeah. they're down there. And so right. I would settle for some tree, just a tree plant. For down right. There. And we, so. we were talking about that too. If you get some shade, actual nature shade going in a place that you thought would likely not need to be developed in the future, which is also a commitment and some type of priority that you've made, but getting some trees going and then something that would provide something. So that'd be great. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you all. Really great feedback. And um, it's fun to think about, you know, the MCBB funds and some of those things. And, you know, I, I know, again, um, our hope had been with the gateway development that we would have more significant transient guest tax revenues generated that would allow us to, to talk about some of these kinds of things. So, um, that's kind of, and I'm. I want to be sensitive. I appreciate everybody's time, but we've we've been here for a while. Um, I think what's the what's my next slide? Okay, so we'll go back to the supplemental. Okay, um, so any other questions, comments, thoughts? Kind of where we have what we have left to do to wrap up. Two things. Brian reminded me that. Um, we were we thank you for taking kind of the straw poll on the revenue neutral rate for the city's budget. We need to do something similar for the drainage districts. Just again, we need to be able to communicate to the county by July 20th that we're at least thinking about it. And then by the time we get our budget adopted, it doesn't commit you to anything. You set your final mill levy uh, before then. But if we don't at least communicate that we're willing to consider that. So if so the the <clears throat> the current mill rate in drainage district number one is 10, uh, 10 and a half mills. If we went with the revenue neutral rate, I believe it goes to three mills. And that's drainage district one is gateway site exclusively. And the um, revenue <clears throat> current mill rate in drainage district number two is 8.793. Um, and I don't recall, it drops pretty significantly as well. Okay, just a little bit. Um, so if, again, I'm sorry. So do you need a, a conciliatory vote on I think each, each just drainage district? A, a willing, a, yeah, a willingness to consider exceeding the revenue neutral rate in drainage district number one. Okay, I'd ask that. <laughs> Kristen, do you have a comment? Okay. Okay. And then the intent to exceed revenue neutral rate for drainage district number two. Yes. <laughs> That's when you say. Are you no. a yes on the first one as well? Okay. And I'm assuming I didn't see Nick. I'm assuming you still indicated a no. Okay. No, he was okay. On the drainage districts, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian, for reminding that. Okay, so the last thing I, we wanted to talk about, um, unless we have other questions about capital and supplemental, is kind of schedule. And what I would do is, if you'll let me kind of just preview the schedule, because what we can do, again, is elongate our schedule slightly. Um, if we're going to have a conversation around exceeding the revenue neutral rate, and one of the the other primary benefits of that is that it will allow us to dedicate time at our August committee meetings to really diving into and having a full-blown presentation on the direction finder survey results that we can then wrap back around. Um, it will give us both August and September committee meetings to kind of have and, and fill out these conversations, including our look at, um, you know, final capital and supplemental requests to be included. So let me, if you'll go to the next slide, please, I just want to kind of recap then what that would look like. Because again, if we intend to exceed the revenue neutral rate, we have until October 1st to actually certify our, our budget to the county. So I think the majority of our kind of base budget work is, is fundamentally in place. Uh, some things we may want to change. 
Um, but I think from a staff's perspective, as we look at direction finder results, we wanna be able to, to maintain that flexibility to say, is, do we have any surprises? I mean, I think we all anticipate that number one priority is still going to be streets, um, but there may be some other things that, that come up that we may want to adjust some of those priorities. So on the 20th, um, on the 21st, we would still have our um, city council meeting and the community dialogue on the 2022 budget. Um, that I think generally we want to, and it gives us another opportunity um, to ask the public to share kind of the general base budget to solicit some public input and feedback and then be able to incorporate that with the formal results from the direction finder survey. Then coming back at the August committee meeting to review how the presentation from ETC uh, of those direction finder results, potential budgetary impacts, we can certainly on some of any of the questions that you had this evening or around any of the capital or supplemental requests can build out some additional information. Then we would go to the September committee meeting to have the public hearing on the recommended budget as well as the public hearing on the intent to exceed the revenue neutral rate. And then at our September legislative meeting, we would adopt the budget and if the council so desires the a formal resolution. Most of the other cities are not actually adopting the resolution this year, um, but we have a, a sample template so we can certainly consider that. And then we would submit and certify the budget <clears throat> to the county by October 1st. The other thing that that does for us in, in this year is it just gives us a, you know, a couple more months to refine revenue estimates and ex expense estimates uh, and look at all of these things as we continue to go forward. So that would be our recommended um, budget schedule. Um, other thoughts, questions, things we wanna discuss this evening? Just one additional thing, going back to the feasibility study on the community center, can we include an item about our Spanish outreach uh, considering how sizable that community is around this area, I, I'm just not convinced we've done enough to maybe bring some of those folks in or at least let them know about our services, even for things like quinceañeras and stuff like that. So okay. um, if we could potentially make sure we get that discussion piece in there, I, that would be something I'd be interested in hearing what they have to say. I think, I think Council Member Rothrock also, Debbie. Um, I love that. Thank you um, for bringing that up. That's that's a great idea. Um, I was wondering where we're at with the compensation and classification study, and if that comes out of the 2021 or the 2022. Uh, my recommendation would be 2021, and similar to what we did in 2017, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is come back in September so last time we brought late August, early September, we brought kind of the recommendation for implementation. And we typically do that in three stages. So the first is an approval to adjust the ranges. So if we're looking at that target of getting our ranges to 60% of the market, we make the range adjustment. And then there will be a corresponding for, I think in this case, roughly about 60% of our employees, uh, a move to the new range minimum. Um, and we do it, Strategically, we do it in steps so that the impact of the, the investment that the council is making in, in our employees is not lost on one, you know, one paycheck, if you will. So if we follow the track that we did in 2017, we would look at implementing um, potentially in September of this year, the move to the range minimums, then in October, we look at the market adjustments. So kind of getting people based on those new ranges and their tenure in their current position. Um, the, the second piece of that co compensation classification analysis was that market push. And so that would then occur in October and then employees, all of our employees are evaluated in November of each year. And so then that allows people to have the benefit of the new salary ranges and the market adjustments in place and then they have a merit increase that's um, provided in November on top of that. So it really maximizes uh, the dollars that are available for the employees. Um, and then by that time, we also sort of know um, generally the impact of, we'll have our health insurance renewal in place. And so we'll be able to sort of communicate 
uh, as we head into an open enrollment period, that impact of any increase or, you know, again, I don't think we can anticipate a 0% increase for a third year, but um, we can more effectively communicate with the employees about what that impact on their paid checks going forward looks like. So that would be kind of our rollout plan for that. Okay, I just, maybe it's because this, this year's melted together, but I, I just felt like we had talked about it really early in the year, and then we had approved a few things and went back and forth, but I just want to make sure that whenever we do this, however we do this annually or biannually, however many years, that it, we don't take the entire year to actually take action and that all these different variant things can, can change what, we're, what we initially approved months before so i think council member thomas yep So we would look at building just into general fund expenses, which obviously all of this is going to impact your your excess general fund fund balance. Um, but we would look at at um, there's basically a million dollars between what would be programmed in line item and then what would be pulled out of kind of that general fund excess fund balance, um, and then the rest of it comes out of funds other than the general fund. from ARP would be um, I ideally designated to replenishing lost revenue from the community center. Um, I would like to see us, you know, continue those conversations considering we have until 2024 to expend all the dollars. I think about, um, you know, the county is gonna be getting a good lump sum from that. Um, I'd be curious to hear the county's plans and if, knowing that we can spend these dollars on stormwater, if the county is going to end up using any of those towards stormwater and potentially matching availability for us and what could be coming from the, those conversations. If you, you might've already had some. Yeah, no, and, and I can kind of shed some light. The conversations are really starting to ramp up in the last couple of weeks. We've shown that those ARPA funds coming in as just general revenues. Uh, and, and there's a formula that I think will be well under uh, that calculates, you know, how much can be dedicated for lost revenues. But um, our thought is if we bring that in as a transfer into the general fund and document it as replacement for lost revenues, and that could be some of it could be, you know, in parks and recreation, we know there's some in fines and fees, um, you know, we'll kind of look across all of the revenue categories. Sales tax obviously is not, you know, is not one. But what that does then is just by tagging that as replacement of lost revenue, it's basically building to the in in the cleanest way possible your fund balance and your reserve. Because in theory, that's just dropping down to that bottom line in the general fund. And then you have that greater amount of flexibility in how you spend any excess fund reserves. A lot of the conversation that's going on as we are all participating in, in webinars and things like that is the county is going to get a significant, I think close to $116 million again in, in ARPA funding. And they are in the process of trying to coordinate the cities to talk about how best to use those funds and potentially allocate them. Primarily up to this point, our conversations have been focused on um, grants to businesses to not-for-profits for other entities within communities that may be impacted. Part of the challenge there is the record keeping and the reporting requirements. If we spend any of our dollars on that and, and we're exploring how much of that will fall to us if we accept dollars from the county to do the, that kind of programming um, are very, 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 very cumbersome. 
And so I know, particularly in the Northeast, um, and I, Roland Park, for example, has hired a consultant to advise them on, on how best to spend their, their ARPA funds, because I know they were targeting, they didn't have lost revenue that they could specifically dedicate it to. And they were targeting a lot of community grant programs and that sort of thing. Their consultant has said, and is working with them to figure out how to identify those lost revenues and to look at the infrastructure projects again. Um, and then if you are able to free up dollars in other places because you've spent on to replace lost revenue or spend on the stormwater infrastructure, then you can create your own grant program with your own parameters and you don't have all of the federal tracking requirements. So that's kind of, that's the work that, that I think we're doing. Um, I don't think that you would see staff come back probably at this point, at least in 2022, until we get through some of these other things to spend down all of the excess fund balance. I think we wanna leave some of that flexibility. I mean, certainly you're looking at, um, you know, having that 25% fund balance there. So, I mean, we can explore that and look and see once we plug in the supplemental request, but I think we would still take a, a relatively conservative approach um, to that. But that's kind, of, that's kind of where we are with ARPA funds and trying to get that in to impact our bottom line so that we have the greatest degree of flexibility to spend it. And yes, stormwater could absolutely be something that, that we, you know, could spend the ARPA dollars on. Before we get to the department updates and our closing, could you please give us a quick update about our family picnic this Saturday and let us know the, the parameters and yes. the timing? Yes, let me like grab that. my notebook because that was the first thing on my Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, we have the Mission Summer Family Picnic this Saturday from 6 to 10, right? 50% um, chance of rain. Uh, so we will make the call on, we have to make the call on the fireworks by 1 p.m. So keep your fingers crossed, do a little rain dance. Um, but if they come out and set up after 1 p.m. and it rains, we still pay for them. So Ooh. that's our deadline for making the call on the fireworks. But we're gonna have beautiful fireworks weather. So we've got um, done quite a lot of promotion of the event on social media. We'll, we'll have um, free food uh, and drinks for families. There will be the um, Rotary Club will have the beer garden. And so the beer will be available for sale. A lot fire of the- truck. Um, Do we have the fire truck Fire coming? truck is coming, oh, good. yes. We do have an inflatable slide, so there'll be some things for the kids to do, but not the bounce houses where everybody's in the bounce house together. Um, police department will be there with their equipment, the opportunity to, to meet people and all of that. So um, please plan to join us at Broadmoor Park from six to 10. Fireworks will roughly 9.15 or dusk. And do we have a band this year? Yes, there is a band and I can't remember the name of the band. Vinyl Records. Vinyl, Vinyl Records. Vinyl Re Final revival. <laughs> there you go. So we're excited to be able to um, to offer that again to the community and hope that the weather will cooperate. Um, I know we've had some conversations in the past about the uh, Mocan swim championships, and we had some concerns about just the volume of people that 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 would that brings into our facility and the impact corresponding impacts. We've been in conversation with the Mocan Swim League for several months. They last week decided that they are actually going to hold this year's championships at the indoor aquatic facility in Lenexa. Um, ultimately, I think they would like to be back. They love hosting at our pool. Um, had they been here for one day or two days, they were willing to look at alternate arrangements to address some of the parking concerns and considerations, but we will not be hosting championships this year. Uh, hope to come back um, in the future. In fact, I think Mark Sutton is trying to find a video to share with Penn because Penn's never experienced uh -oh, the, amazing. Um, the championships and um, the flock of swimmers and their families that, that come. Um, as we've already talked about, Direction Finder Survey, they um, 
are wrapping up. They took surveys through the end of last week. And uh, so we should start to see at least some preliminary results next week, um, which will be great. We're excited for that. As we mentioned, um, we had tremendous response. They were over, I don't know how far over their 400 return rate on that, but um, that was very exciting. Um, if you get questions, I don't, I'm getting lots of questions because we sent out a letter last week to the Roland Court Homes Association property owners that opened up the prepayment window for their special assessment. Um, and so getting a lot of questions uh, just about how do they pay it and all of that, but it, it is a prepayment window specifically designed if anyone wants to pay that entire 22 year total up front or some large portion of that. We've had some residents who, who are confused about whether that's going to be an annual payment to the city or assessed on their tax bills. So if you happen to get any questions, uh, I think they're coming to us, but if you happen to get any questions on that, please feel free to pass those on uh, to me. And then um, we had an email that came out today and um, We'll be starting here in the next week, week and a half, our readiness assessment for the racial equity um, work that we're doing with UCS. So looking forward to getting um, that started. And I think the only other thing I have is the chief who has been patiently waiting for his slot at the FBI National Academy, uh, had that open up last week. And so the chief will be participating in the National Academy uh, in October for 10 weeks. Um, so very exciting. Uh, and I think that's all I have this evening, which is plenty. Any comments or questions before we move to close? I move to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is now 9.08 p.m. And with no further discussion, that concludes the meeting of the Finance and Administration Committee. Again, this video will be made public on our website at missionks.org. Thank you.